October 23rd, 1999. It was a special day for my wife and I. It was our wedding day. And I vividly remember the moments that was entailed in that day. Exchanging our vows, sharing the joyous occasion with our family and friends. And who could ever forget opening the wedding gifts? Yeah. And discovering glassware and silverware and three crock pots. <laughs> Cash gifts. But there was one gift in particular that stood out. And I have to be completely frank with you. I was a little baffled when, when we opened the package. It, it wasn't a small appliance. It wasn't a toaster or a blender. It was a toolbox. And I was, I tried to be grateful, but in my mind I was thinking the toolbox was not on the wedding registry. <laughs> Who would give me a toolbox? But over time, the one gift that has offered the greatest value to our family over time has been that toolbox. Actually, some of my greatest creations and, um, and disasters around my house are largely attributed to to my imagination and my toolbox. And many of you can relate. Having a vision of what you want to create, and you immediately think, hey, what are the tools, what are the resources that I need to help me facilitate this process? Creativity, innovation, we love it. In the world, we have a fascination with it. But I feel a need to pause just for a moment and to acknowledge the obvious, that the innovative process is one that is daunting, that is arduous, that is challenging. It's, it's not always clean and contiguous, and, and actually sometimes it's absolutely frustrating and overwhelming. Sometimes it forces us to take a step back and, and ask, why in the world did I start this project? And so what I would love for us to do for the next few moments is to take a peek into the innovator's toolbox and to identify maybe three tools that can be useful to ensure that we stay engaged in this process. You know, once we get past the preliminary steps of, for example, uh, creating urgency to start the process or gleaning insight from inspiration that, that prompts us to, to engage the process of innovation. But once we get through those preliminary steps, how do we stay engaged in the process? And so I have a few suggestions that I would like to offer that have been a resource to me and others who have mentored and, and, and worked with me in, in times past. So, a beautiful photo. So the first suggestion that I want to offer is smiles. Smiles. And, and the smile is, is an expression that characterizes uh, positive emotions, joy, hope, gratitude, zest. You know, we know for a fact that positive emotions, that they have the power to generate and to sustain momentum. They're excellent in the change process. But I hear you telepathically asking me, well, you know, how can we control emotions? You know, they're naturally elicited. They're naturally evoked. They're a natural response to a situation. And so one consideration that I would love for you to ponder is to think about what the, the, the type of context that we can create that enables positive emotions to emerge on a consistent basis. And let's face it, when we're engaged in this, this process of change, many times negative emotions, they tend to emerge. Feelings of doubt. Fear. Anger. Insecurity. And so I think it's absolutely critical that we, that we really ponder ways to create a culture that allows these positive emotions to emerge. We know from research that there is this direct connection that exists between emotions and mindset. And so some of you have, are familiar with the research of, of Carol Dweck out of Stanford University. And she's done a ton of research on neuroplasticity and how intelligence is not static, but it's actually developed. 
But when you think about this notion, mindset is the soil that cultivates emotional responses. So if you, if you think about um, growth mindset, growth mindset naturally cultivates and nurtures the development of positive emotions. Whereas fixed mindset, it provides the soil that nurtures, that nurtures negative emotions. So I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with a, a colleague. And uh, this gentleman, he taught a math course on class. And uh, he had a class of about 15 to 18 students. And many of the students were absolutely terrified of math. Actually, he had about five students in the class who were seniors, and they waited until the last semester to complete that one general education course to, to complete their, their, their degree program. And so with every class, he had this common spiel on the first day, and it was all about shifting your perspective, making this paradigm shift. Right? Look, at, look at math differently. You know? What you see is how you feel, so look, look differently at math. And students, for about five minutes, they would feel comforted. And they're like, oh, I can do this. And then he would put a compound fraction on the dry erase board. And then they were searching for the drop ad form quickly, right? <laughs> and so he talked to me about this experience. He's like, I, I don't know what we can do. I mean, how do I approach this differently so that students bring a, a different psychological lens to this course? And I said, hey, have you ever considered covering growth and fixed mindset as an option? Because it really hits the notion that, hey, we have the capacity. It's just about leveraging the amount of, of effort. It's, it's, it's assessing the resources that I have at my disposal, whether they're internal or external. He said, that's, that's a good idea. Let me try that on the first day. And so what he decided to do was to cover growth and fixed mindset and highlight some of the main facets of, of Dweck's uh, research. And he also intersected that with the strengths perspective. And so he had all the students reflect on their unique capacity. What are the resources that you're bringing into this classroom that can help you become successful? Because you can leverage those resources as pathways to meet your goal. And he said that the dispositions of the students shifted immediately. And students felt alive. And they felt capable. And, and they, they came up with a classroom norm. That they could, be, they could be completely transparent about their feelings towards math. So if they didn't understand a math concept, they could say, hey, I don't understand this. But they had to add one word at the end, yet. Or I don't understand this now. And it sends the message that you are capable of understanding it. It just takes time. And students walked into the classroom with a, a heightened sense of joy, with a, a heightened sense of hope with a heightened sense of optimism. And so those positive emotions created momentum. I actually saw one of the students on, on campus, and she said, I remember you were that guy that talked about growth mindset and, and strengths with our instructor. And I'm like, yeah, that's me, Denzel Washington. <laughs> and I said, how did you do in the course? She said, I did great. I did great. I actually, you know, I was just, initially I just wanted to pass the course. But I actually got to be in the course. And I said, great job. Well, that's pretty good. Great job. <laughs> right? Great job. So positive emotions is huge. Uh, by the way, we actually have companies, Fortune 100 companies across our, our country who, who are trying to cultivate what we call a growth mindset culture. So companies that, that are highly innovative, such as Microsoft and Southwest. I love flying Southwest. <laughs> so the first tool that we see in the innovator's toolbox is, is smiles, smiles. The second tool I would love for you to consider, oh, by the way, I love this thought by, by Dr. Fredrickson. Positivity doesn't just change the contents of your mind. It widens the span of possibilities that you see. And that tends to be a direct benefit of positive emotion, positive emotion. The second tool that I would love for you to consider is style, is style. 
And so when you see the term style and you see this image on the screen, you're probably thinking about, man, Dr. Hall looks very nice on stage. Look at him, just smooth, good looking. By the way, I am married, so I'm sorry, all right? <laughs> but really what I'm getting at with style is, is not what we wear, but how we're wired. And so when I think of the term innovation, some names immediately come to mind, such as Beethoven and Mozart and Maya Angelou and, and Duke Ellington and Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, but the off-the-wall thriller Michael Jackson, all right? The, the, you know, that, that's when he was at his best. These are individuals who engage the innovative process with their unique resources, they didn't try to engage the process like others. They knew how to lean into their natural proclivities and inclinations to, to, to realize their vision. So when you think of someone like Albert Einstein, he leaned into curiosity to produce academic developments that we still reference today. Or when you think about Michael Jordan who leaned into competition to revolutionize, revolutionize professional athletics and even even branding, or, or Michael Jackson, who had the strength of maximizer, everything had to be perfect, the right note, the right rhythm, the right sound, the right lyric, and he knew that all of those pieces would be integrated to make perfect music that would translate just one demographic of people. So how do we stay engaged in this process? We lean into our capacity. We lean into our capacity. We, we embrace our unique, our unique style. So my introduction as a higher ed professional goes back, you know, go, goes back to 2001. And uh, I, I had a good relationship with the dean who was a mentor for me. And he invited me to teach Psychology 101. And I had 35 traditional college students in the classroom waiting for me. And to be honest with you, when he extended the invitation to me, I thought, man, I am special. But I didn't know that he, <laughs> he gave me a class that nobody else wanted to teach, right? It was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class at 8 o'clock in the morning. And so he couldn't get any full-time faculty members to teach it. So he said, hey, Keith, would you like to teach? And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and so I remember vividly walking into the classroom and and I was, I was well prepared. I was definitely motivated. And uh, I, you know, went through my diagrams. I, I, I shared the content, and I felt it went well. And he was sitting in the audience, and, you know, I concluded and spoke to a couple of students. And he came beside me. He said, hey, before you take off, drop by my office. And I'm like, okay, I will. So, you know, I excused myself from the classroom, went to his office. He said, hey, hey, close the door. And I'm like, oh, this is not good, all right? <clears throat> I closed the door, felt like I was in the principal's office, and he asked me, uh, uh, Keith, what was that? And I said, pardon me? He, what was that? I said, that was teaching. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I've, I've seen you present before, and, and, and that's not you. And I said, well... You know, as I was preparing, I thought about instructors that I had in times past, and I thought, hey, that is scholastic delivery. I need to model what I had seen. You know, I thought I needed to be monotone, throw in a couple of words like thy, thou, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, <laughs> that's academic, right? And he was like, no, no, no. He said, listen, the reason why I invited you to teach is because I like your enthusiasm, I like your energy, I like the zest that you bring to an audience. And I knew that students would be engaged if you approach the course that way. And I said, it's okay for me to do that? He said, absolutely, actually I want you to do that and if you don't do that, I won't invite you back. I said, okay, not a problem. <laughs> Listen, that was a very liberating conversation for me. Because I, I stepped into the classroom the next time, not feeling the burden of trying to do it like someone else. I felt like I could step into that space and be completely myself to present from an authentic, a authentic space. And what I quickly assessed is that my students were engaged and they were nodding and they were smiling. 
But I was also engaged and I was loving it. And it didn't feel like work. And so the, the second tool that I would love for you to consider is, is, is your style. Leaning into your talent. Leaning into your strengths. Leaning, leaning into your interests and your passions and your natural proclivities. What a great conversation with my mentor. I love this quote, by the way, this age-old quote from Oscar Wilde. Be yourself, everyone else is taken. Isn't that a great thought? It's just such a great thought, and it's good to reflect on that from time to time. Hey, some other research that's just tied to strengths. We know from, from some studies that have been done by Gallup that individuals and professionals who employ their strengths on a day-to-day -day basis, they are six times more likely to be engaged in their work and even in the process of innovating and change. So it really behooves us to, to first identify our strengths, but secondly, develop them. Thirdly, lean into them, apply them. The last thought I want to share with you, the last tool, is substance. It's substance. So in the process of change, I think I have been guilty as a, as a high achiever, and some of you may be able to relate to this, to become very inundated with the details. So you focus on the day-to-day, -day and sometimes we lose sight of the, the larger vision. And so I would say that one incredible tool to, to consider placing in your toolboxes is the tool of purpose and meaning. I would say that the vast majority of us that work in higher education, we're not doing it for, for popularity or for prestige or for fiscal capital, even though we want to be compensated based on our contribution. But as cliche as it may sound, most of us, we're in this industry because we want to make a difference. We want to know that our presence, that the conversations that we had, that the work and time that we expended, that it, it made students better. It made our community better. And in some way, it made the world better. So taking a few moments to step back and to reflect and say, why am I doing this? Extending beyond just the what and exploring deeply the why. The innovator's toolbox smiles style, and substance. Thank you so much.